Good evening, everyone. May, may I ask you to take your seats if you haven't already done so? Thank you very much. I would like to welcome you all here this evening, um, our wonderful class of 2017, uh, the extraordinary young women who uh, applied for and were accepted into our program and who represent the face of the future. Please, <laughs> we need as we need all the help we can get right now. Um, and I think the women will save us, yes? The women will save us. So uh, welcome to that group and welcome also to our um, guests, uh, many of whom have been supporters of the Center for Women's and Gender Studies for many, many years. Thank you once again for being here for us. Um, my job is simply to say um, in advance of the formal introduction of Senator Wendy Davis just how delighted and honored we are to have her with us today. It, um, it's always um, a delight to hear from um, a woman who has experienced what it means to be in politics, um, to succeed in politics, and to fight the battle that needs to be fought, it seems, every single day. Uh, it's especially wonderful to have Senator Wendy Davis here, who fought so hard um, for us um, during the special session and I, I blocked out from my memory when it was because it was, um, it was so awful. But then, then we had this year's and I thought, oh, well, <laughs> it wasn't perhaps so bad after all. Uh, but Senator Wendy Davis is my hero. Um, we stood uh, outside the Capitol building, many of us, in support of her and I'm just uh, thrilled and honored that she could be with us today. So please welcome um, the introducer for our Senator Wendy Davis. This is not going to go on all night, by the way. We're going to stop here. Um, my name is Emily Pinat, and I am from UT Tyler. And today I have the honor to introduce Wendy Davis. And I actually did not see myself here three years ago standing in front of a beautiful young woman introducing her. And she represented District 10 in the Texas Senate also known as the Fort Worth area. She was also the Democratic nominee for Texas governor in the 2014 election. Um, she's also very um, known for June 25, 2013, when she held a 13-hour filibuster to block Senate Bill 5, which included more restricted abortion regulations for Texas. Davis has two daughters and granddaughter named Ellis. She started a nonprofit um, called Deeds, Not Words, which is very similar to Leadership Texas, helping young women find their voice and help them find the path towards their impact, their future impact. For fun, she likes to run, bike the streets of Austin, but her favorite thing is to be with her family. Um, we have the honor to introduce Senator Davis. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Emily, thank you for the introduction. That was so nice. And first I want to start by saying how empowered I feel, inspired I feel by being with all of you this evening. It's been a long week. Yesterday was a pretty hard day, I think, for a lot of us who care about the decision that was made um, in the administration. So in some ways, it's been a hard week, too. But how uplifting, really, to find myself here with all of you tonight and to hear the stories of the graduates of this program, to know the impact that you all are making out in the world. It's really phenomenal. Um, and I'm looking forward, hopefully, to coming back next year or the next year and hearing the impact that all of you are making, the, the soon-to-be graduates of the Leadership Texas program. I was asked to come and talk a little bit about leadership, um, what my experiences have been like, and what I've learned along the way, and hopefully to provide you some of the lessons that, that I've learned. I'll have to say that when I was a very young woman, young girl, I thought that a leader was a person who was popular. I kind of conflated those two ideas. And I didn't really see myself in that way. I was a very, very shy girl. 
Um, in school, I was more on the nerd side than anything. Um, I was not a cheerleader or a student council president or popular, really. And I've heard a few of you say that you never imagined that you would be on the path that you're on right now. I can assure you when I was a young girl in middle school and high school, I certainly never imagined that for myself either. But what I've come to understand is that leadership really doesn't have anything to do with popularity. And in fact, leaders can find themselves pretty unpopular sometimes, depending on the positions that they're taking. And instead, I think the most important qualities to really find your way to being a true leader are empathy, uh, the ability to give up on your fear of failure, and an understanding that to lead means to be a part of a community effort on a shared concern. And I'll talk a little bit about each of those. So starting with the idea of empathy. How many of you, when you were growing up, would put your mom's shoes on, her high heels or whatever shoes, and clomp around in those? When I think about empathy, I, I think about it in that regard. Um, putting on the shoes of other people, considering the life experiences, the life journeys that other people have had. And many of you have mentioned tonight how incredible this program has been for you because it's given you the opportunity to do just that, to consider the perspectives of other people, to put yourself into their shoes and to learn from that experience. And that has certainly been an important part of, of my life. If you think about the history of some of the most profound and important decisions that have happened in this country, you have to look at it and marvel at how much of it came from exactly that capacity, the capacity that people had to put themselves into the shoes of others. Go back to when we gained the right to vote in this country almost 100 years ago. It was a bunch of men that had to make that decision, right? And it was a lot of men who had to consider why it was important, not just for women, but for this country as a whole, for women to have the franchise, to be given the opportunity to voice our perspectives and opinions at the ballot box. And if you know very much about that story, the holdout vote, the final swing congressional vote, was called by his mother that morning and told that he better not come home for dinner if he did not vote to provide women with the right to vote. Um, the same is true of, of so many other stories that have happened in our country and that have really changed the dynamic of who we are. I remember very clearly the first time I really kind of understood how important this idea of stepping into the shoes of other people was. It was when I was in law school. I took a class called the Warren Court. And for those who are lawyers in the room or who are in law school right now, what you know is you take these classes where you learn kind of how the law began on a particular issue and then another case came along and changed it a little bit. And you're learning kind of the way the law develops over time. But this class was unique because we weren't just learning about the way the law changed. We were thinking about it from the perspective of the fact that human beings were behind the decisions that made those changes in the law. And Earl Warren, who was the chief uh, Supreme Court, the head of the Supreme Court, Chief Justice, back in the 50s and 60s, the Earl Warren Supreme Court was one of the most pivotal decision-making courts of our time and truly changed the dynamic of civil liberties in this country. Two of the most important things that they did, desegregating the public schools and, of course, uh, striking down what was an a ban against interracial marriage in this country. And the interesting story about Earl Warren, he was thinking about running for president himself. He had been the Attorney General of California in 1952. Eisenhower was trying to nudge him out of the primary race because he really needed California to come his way. And he promised Earl Warren, who by the way had never been a judge, who was not a lawyer, 
He promised her a warren that if he would back away and not run for president, that the first opening on the Supreme Court would be given to him. Well, lo and behold, not long after Eisenhower was elected, uh, the Chief Justice Fred Vinson died in his sleep, and Earl Warren, of course, came to Eisenhower to collect on this promise, and he said, I'll take that position very much. And Eisenhower said, thank you very much. And Eisenhower said, okay, I'll put you on the court. And he said, no, I don't want to just be on the court. You promised me the first position that opened up on the court, and that first position is the Chief Justice position, and that's the position that I want. And believe it or not, he got that position. And at the time, the court had already heard the Brown versus Board of Education decision, which is the decision that desegregated public schools. And it was a, a swing vote. With Earl Warren coming on to the court, it was easily a five to four vote. He could have immediately written an opinion and been done with it and moved on to the next thing. But Earl Warren was a real leader. Earl Warren understood that this was going to come at a time in our country against the backdrop of a lot of people who were not going to be happy with this decision, and that unless the Supreme Court could unanimously decide this and show a united front on behalf of desegregating our public schools, it was likely to create even greater turmoil than he knew it was going to create anyway. And so Earl Warren used his own personal experiences to help those four other justices find something in their own lives that helped them eventually come to the capacity to put themselves in the shoes of these young children who were not being provided with the same educational opportunities as other children in our country and to speak up on their behalf. For Earl Warren, that experience came when Isaac, excuse me, Roosevelt, FDR, was president. As a Democrat, I have a lot that I admire about what FDR did, but one of the things that you may not realize is that he was the president who actually issued the executive order to inter the Japanese during World War II. People who had committed no crime um, people who simply were guilty of being of Japanese descent were put into prison camps, essentially. And Earl Warren, um, in California, where most of those camps were set up, as Attorney General was tasked with carrying out that order. And he talked about in his autobiography the fact that when he went to those camps and he saw the human indignities that he had played a role in making happen, he saw families that have been split apart, men separated from wives and children, sound familiar in this country today, by the way, he understood that he had played a role in something that was really terrible. And it really changed the way he thought about things. And it made him a fighter for people in a way that I don't think he ever would have been had he not had that experience. Each and every one of us has something like that in our lives, whether it's something that's happened to us personally uh, or something that we've been witness to through the views or the lens of someone that we really care about. It's shaped who we are. It's shaped the way we identify ourselves and the values that we connect to. And it has shaped the things that we've decided are important and worth fighting for. In essence, it's really shaped our ability to be leaders. And I think you really can't be a leader if you don't have that capacity, because to be a leader is not just about um, having a dynamic personality and perhaps great uh, rhetorical skills to convince people of your perspective. Being a real leader means having the capacity to listen to the perspective of other people and to learn from them and to allow that to shape the things that you fight for and that you work to advance. Another great example of that is Justice Kennedy. Justice Kennedy, of course, wrote the Obergefell opinion, which was the opinion that legalized gay marriage in this country. Uh, Justice Kennedy was a heterosexual man, is a heterosexual man who 
grew up in a very conservative Catholic family. And yet when he was in law school, his mentor, and then when he became uh, a professor at a law school, this same person, his mentor, was a gay man. They were very, very close. And not long before the Obergefell decision was written, he passed away. And I really believe that Justice Kennedy's opinion, and he wrote these words, they, the plaintiffs, ask for equal dignity in the eyes of the law. The Constitution grants them that right. He was able to think about that dignity through the lens of someone that he loved very much. Someone whose shoes he placed himself in, even though his life experiences were not like that at all. And in fact, as you may know, Justice Kennedy was also the swing and very important vote in the decision recently, uh, last summer actually, that overturned that anti-abortion law in Texas. That was the whole Women's Health versus Hellerstadt decision. And again, Justice Kennedy demonstrated the capacity to put himself in the shoes of women who'd been impacted by that law. And the plaintiffs did a phenomenal job of putting together briefs that told the personal stories of women who had been impacted because everyone understood that Justice Kennedy was going to be the swing vote and that it was important to ask him to put himself in the shoes of people who'd been impacted. So incredible leaders. I remember very clearly another experience that I had watching two women who demonstrated the capacity to put themselves in each other's shoes in a situation that you would think might be impossible. I attended a leadership conference in New York a few years ago, the Women in the World Conference. And there were two women who spoke there, uh, Robbie Damlin and Bushra Awad were their names, one Israeli, the other Palestinian. And each of them had lost a beloved and precious son to the conflict between their two home states. You might think that two people who lost their sons in this bitter conflict might find themselves very bitter toward each other. What was really beautiful about them was that they decided to take this shared tragedy and to use it as a force for change. They created something called the Parent Circle Family Forum. There are now 600 Palestinian and Israeli families that are members of this forum, and they are working to try to be a part of a peaceful solution to what's happening there. And what really struck me about them, as they were sitting on the stage, I couldn't help notice they were wearing the same black and white high top Converse tennis shoes. <laughs> And it was a very purposeful choice. And in fact, it is the uniform footwear of everyone who is a member of the Parent Circle Family Forum, a literal symbol of the fact that they are in each other's shoes. A powerful lesson, I think, for all of us to understand. When I stood on the Senate floor, almost exactly four years ago for 13 hours. I showed up, of course, in a pair of pink tennis shoes that a lot of people know about. But I really showed up wearing the shoes of my own life experiences, the journeys that I had walked, the journeys that my mother and my grandmother had walked. And I think each of us does that. We bring multi-generational stories with us, the experiences of the people that we love, the people who have sacrificed to try to make our lives better. And I think it's an obligation that we carry with us to bring their lives forward in the things that we do. My maternal grandmother had only a sixth grade education. My maternal grandfather only a fourth grade education. They had 14 children. They were tenant farmers. They never had the privilege of owning and farming their own land. And in fact, they weren't able to buy a home 
until they went on social security because it was the first time in their lives that they had a stable enough income to qualify for a loan. My mom, one of those 14 children, made it only through ninth grade before she had to help out at home and wasn't able to finish school. And when my parents divorced when I was quite young, my mother, armed with that ninth grade education, became the sole support financially for our family of four children. And we lived in poverty, we, we struggled. I'm not telling you that because I want you to feel sorry for me. I'm telling you that because I want you to understand that that experience was something that I carried forward with me into my political life. And it was something that I never forgot and it forms the basis of so much of what I fought for in that political position. It was my journey, my shoes that I showed up in. When I was young, I became a single mother. At 18, I discovered that I was pregnant. I was filled with the idea that I was gonna be the first person in my family to graduate from college, and when I found out that I was pregnant, I thought that that dream had come to an end. I got married and divorced very quickly, and soon I was struggling, just as my mother had struggled, to raise a child on an income that was not uh, one that was really able to sustain our family. And I was able to move forward in my path because I had some things that were made available to me that made that possible, and I've never forgotten that. One was affordable higher education. So many of you have talked about community college. I started at community college, Tarrant County College in Fort Worth, and if it hadn't been for the affordability of that place, there's simply no way I ever would have gotten my higher education, my opportunity to actually one day go to Harvard Law School. I also had something that's so important for women, and that is affordable, quality childcare. I had family members who helped me, I had friends who helped me, and I was able to pay for what I needed in addition to that. And if it hadn't been for that, there's simply no way I could have gone to school, I was holding down two jobs and going to community college at the same time, and I simply wouldn't have been able to do that if I hadn't had childcare. This is a very personal issue to me, understanding that in this country today there are so many women for whom that is the single thing that's holding them back from realizing their full potential. And why it is that I carry that experience forward with me and that's something that I work on and that I fight for. And then finally, the only health care that I received for several years during that period of time, I received from a Planned Parenthood clinic near my home. They provided me as an uninsured woman with access to free care, with access to free contraceptive care, and I am fully aware of the fact that if I had faced a second unplanned pregnancy at that time, if I hadn't had that contraceptive care, I likely would not have been able to continue the path that I was on. So you may understand now why it is that the two filibusters I conducted in Texas, one was on funding for education, and the other, of course, was women's reproductive freedoms, because my own experiences, of course, instructed me in that regard. Now, leadership, of course, is not always about winning, either. It sometimes involves failure. It sometimes involves huge public failure that can be really, really hard. Um, I lost my very first race that I ever entered. I decided that I was going to run for the city council when I think I was 33 years old in Fort Worth. And I made it into a runoff, and I lost the runoff by 90 votes. And I truly thought I was going to die. <laughs> I will never forget the feeling of waking up that next morning and feeling as though somehow I had been personally rejected. But I took the time to consider why I had lost, um, to consider that perhaps I hadn't proven myself to the community well enough, 
And I set about making sure that over the next couple of years, I was gonna do exactly that. And when I ran again three years later, I succeeded and served on the city council for five terms before I was elected to the Texas Senate. But I had a big, fat, public, widely known fail in 2014. I decided I was gonna run for governor. And thank you, by the way, to the people in the room who worked on my campaign. I've met several young women who participated in that. And that experience may, if you think about it, looking from the outside, may be something I would say I wish I hadn't done. But I have to tell you, I've learned so much about the value of fighting for things that matter to you. And that sometimes, even when you fail, you are moving the ball forward in a way that you may not recognize all the time. Literally every single week, not a week goes by, that I don't have a young woman come to me and say, I followed your gubernatorial campaign, or I watched your filibuster, or I you know, knocked on doors to try to help you get elected, and I changed my major, or I decided to do this now instead of what I was going to do. And it makes you realize that you create these little ripple impacts and you carry forward the opportunity to be a part of a conversation that hopefully begins to move public opinion on the issues that you care greatly about, even if you aren't immediately successful in accomplishing them. When I lost that race, I remember so clearly the next morning, I stayed in the old Texas hotel, which is in Fort Worth. It's the place where John F. Kennedy spent his last night before he was assassinated. It was the place that I stayed the night that I won my 2008 Senate race, a race that I was not supposed to win and that every political pundit predicted I would lose. And I remember waking up on that morning with just the awe of having succeeded at something so hard. And I also remember waking up the morning after the 2014 election loss feeling as though I'd let a lot of people down that I was fighting for. Again, I wouldn't change the fact that I tried to do that because there's so much value in it. And when I went to my campaign headquarter that day, I remember going into the room gathered there were kind of the you know 40 50 people who had been like the the real key workers of our campaign and i needed to say something to them and i wasn't really sure what i was going to say and i opened my mouth and the most honest thing spilled out which was i and i used the curse word i won't use it here <laughs> i effing hate to lose is what i said to them and that, that part of me, that competitive part of me, of course, has helped to sustain me through some really difficult journeys. It's important to connect with that. It's okay to be competitive, and it's okay to be upset when you lose. But it's not okay to fear losing so much that you're not willing to put yourself out there and try to do something hard. You've probably heard this quote, although you may not know, it's from an American pastor. His name is Robert Schuler. The quote, we see it on, you know, little things that we put on our refrigerator and elsewhere. What is the one thing that you would attempt if you knew you could not fail? And of course, his question is meant to inspire in us to think about our dreams for ourselves and, and what it is that we'd like to achieve. But I would ask a slightly different question of you. And the question that I would ask is, what are you willing to fight for, even if the odds are stacked against you, even if you will likely lose? And in answering that question, you're going to define not just what's important to you, you're really going to define the very essence of who you are. 
In my 54 years, I have found that the things worth fighting for are always the hardest, and that there's always something to be gained in participating in that fight, even when you don't succeed. There's so much meaning in speaking truth to power and bringing your truth forward in whatever format that is and whatever that looks like for you. I am always inspired by a quote that I've kept up in my home ever since my girls were, were really small. It is a quote by Teddy Roosevelt. Um, it's called The Arena, if you want to look it up online and print it out so you can put it up for yourself. But here's how it goes. It's not the critic who counts, not the, I'm going to say woman instead of man. He didn't say woman, but I'm going to say that. Not the woman who points out how the strong woman stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the woman who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends herself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if she fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that her place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. So I'm asking you to take pride when you dare to do something great, when you dare to do something hard and to own your courage and know that the only way we'll fail is if we stop trying. That is the only true definition of failure. Don't get me wrong, I still truly hate to lose. <laughs> um, but it's okay to hate that. I think it drives us. It provides us with the kind of drive that we need to get through some hard challenges. But the losses that I've endured have taught me that I am more powerful than the limitation of failed efforts. So my advice to you, if you fail, I want you to fail big. Fail with flair. Fail because you're trying to do something so much bigger than you are. And take the satisfaction, as Roosevelt says, of knowing that you're brave enough to get into that arena and you're so much better off than that timid person who's standing on the sideline never daring to know victory and defeat. And then finally, Leadership for me means not going it alone. To be a leader doesn't mean you have to get out there ahead of the rest of the pack and be doing something in an isolated way. It means that you find shared experiences and bring them together in community and use that voice in a way that becomes even more powerful because there are so many of you who have joined together to do it. I had the privilege of being a part of one of the most extraordinary political experiences of my lifetime. And that was the day that we, and I say we very purposefully, conducted what became known as the People's Filibuster in Texas in June of 2013. On that day, which I started uh, by having a doctor come to my home to fit me for a catheter, um, on that day, of course, I put on those pink tennis shoes, and I like to say now that that's kind of the female arsenal that we need for doing political battle in a state like this. I never could have expected what the day would become. And the reason the day became extraordinary in any way didn't have anything to do with me. It was the people who showed up. And I talked to some, some folks here this evening 
who were there at the Capitol that night. People who got up that morning eating their cold cereal, having absolutely no intention of going to the Texas Capitol, but who heard what was going on and decided that it was important that they show up. Never expecting that their voices were ever actually going to be a part of that day. But what you may know is that at about 15 minutes before midnight, the lieutenant governor called the filibuster to an end. And what that meant was that that bill was going to be voted on and it was going to pass into law. In that moment, my sister Senate colleague, Leticia Vandepute, stood up and asked a pertinent question, not just in that moment, but in a broader sense as well. And its broader meaning wasn't lost on anyone in the room. Her question was, Mr. President, at what point is a woman's raised hand or raised voice to be heard over those of her male colleagues in the room? And when she asked that question, it lit a spark in the gallery. Everyone in the gallery stood and began screaming with all their might. And that lit a spark into the halls of the Capitol, which by the way, the Capitol had to be closed for the first time in its history because it was filled to capacity. All of those people in the hallways on every level of the rotunda standing and screaming outside on the Capitol lawn where they were gathered because they couldn't fit into the Capitol building, screaming with one beautiful, thunderous, noisy voice of what it means to participate, not just figuratively, but literally in a democracy. And it was because of their voices that the Secretary of the Senate was unable to take that voice vote in time for the midnight deadline. And of course, at least temporarily, that bill died. Now, yes, a few days later, the governor called us back to a special session and it passed. But we learned something important in Texas that day. We learned that in a state where we tend to believe that these decisions are pre-made, that the deck is stacked, that it just won't matter if we show up and speak out against something that we believe to be an injustice, that we really can make an impact. And that's, of course, what this program hopes to help you to see about yourself, that I hope to help you see about yourself. No matter your political perspective or persuasion, no matter where you stand on issues vis-a-vis -vis where I stand, your voice matters. And it really is an important part of helping to shape the conversation in a way that hopefully is going to include enough diversity of perspective that we're going to come to reflective decisions. You come from very diverse backgrounds. You come from experiences that are often absent in local elected bodies and state legislative bodies and certainly at the national level. All the more reason why you're needed. All the more reason why your voices need to be a part of that conversation. Because without you showing up in the shoes you've walked your own personal journey on, without you carrying forward the stories of mothers and grandmothers and their struggles, without you carrying forward the life experiences of friends that you've met along the way or people that you've read about and been struck by, without you, those voices will be absent from the conversation. And it doesn't mean that you have to be an elected official. I know some of you are saying you want to run for office. Great. I know some of you are saying maybe you just want to help someone get elected to run for office. Great too. Whatever piece you play, whatever role you play in shaping the political dynamic, the public discourse, the policy making of this country, please hold that responsibility dear 
because if you don't, other people are going to make these decisions for us and they're not going to be made in a way that's going to reflect the journey, the shoes that you show up in. I wish you so much success in your journey. I wish you some failure in your journey. <laughs> um, and I wish you the incredible capacity to learn from other people. It is a beautiful skill to have. And my prayers are with you all. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you.